All right, hello friends, let's get started. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I understand that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is uh, speaking at this very moment. Uh, this is an admirable crowd, especially in light of the hour, the day, and the competition. Uh, Christian pointed out to me that his title and Ruth Bader Ginsburg's title, title start with the same word, associate. So there's a sort of rough equality there. Um, I wonder if I could ask, I don't mean to inconvenience people, but I wonder if I could ask the people who are on the periphery of the edge of this gathering to move more towards the center because it will create a better atmosphere and because the speakers will be more able to see you. Today's panel is on the uh, contention which I take to be one of the central contentions of the modern left, the contention that everything is political, that the terms of social life uh, the terms of political dispute are so capacious and encompassing that there is virtually no uh, sphere of enterprise that is immune from, from uh, politics. Um, that is to say, science, law, music, family, all the various things that make up our our hobbies, our social lives, our personal concerns, all the things that we might ordinarily think to be set aside from topics of uh, policy, government, and the like, are in fact part of government and policy. Indeed, language itself is part of the terms of political dispute in society. Po politics is part of all of it. In, I, I remember this from when I was an undergraduate at Yale College, where it sort of took tragicomic form. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the senior thesis topics, I would hear my friends and acquaintances uh, present. You would say, what are you doing for your senior thesis to a music major? I was a music major. Um, and they would say, cello performance and social justice. Or you talk to your math friend, and they would say, set theory and social justice. Or you would talk to your historian friend, and they would say, ancient Chinese history and social justice. It was always and social justice, just for reasons of social status. I mean, you needed to have social justice attached to the title of your senior thesis to be respectable among your peers. Um, the, the implicit thesis of that practice is, you know, let nothing, let no sphere of learning be uh, set aside from the effort to uh, uh, make the world more just in the eyes of those who think of justice this way. There, there should be no shelter from the storm. But there's a more serious argument undergirding this. I think it is most brilliantly, and I choose that word advisedly, I think it is a brilliant argument. It is most brilliantly set forth by Catherine McKinnon and Roberto Unger, in my view. It is that the categories of social life are constructed, and those categories are constructed by means of power. Uh, Insofar as we are disputing the power relationships that led to those categories, uh, all the terms of social life are open to what we broadly characterize as political dispute. Uh, so think about gender as an example that both of them took seriously, and Catherine McKinnon especially seriously. Uh, gender is not just biological sex. It is, uh, it is a culturally inflected category created by uh, power relationships between men and women, and precisely what it is that the modern feminist movement wants to dispute is the creation and nature of those power categories. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Roberto Unger expanded that to uh, virtually all of the terms of social life. He said that politics is open textured. Anything uh, from, from language to gender to baseball can be at any given time rendered, uh, uh, seen in terms of its undergirding power relationships and disputed for that reason. I react to this argument with profound ambivalence. I find it largely persuasive. I am inclined to agree with it. But rather than regarding that with glee, I regard, it, I regard it with foreboding and sadness. For one thing, it seems to me to proffer uh, uh, an unsustainable level of conflict in social life. It means that there is no shelter from the storm between people. I, I walked into my favorite coffee shop in Chicago recently, and the, and the um, person behind the counter was reading a book, How to Love the Republican in Your Life. And uh, she said that she was in, I, I started chatting with her about it. She said she's on the left, she's in love with a boy who's conservative, and she's trying to figure out how to handle that. And uh, I thought, why is it necessary to have a book to address that? But of course, I knew the answer in my heart. I knew it is necessary to have a book to address that, because those things are increasingly difficult for people to negotiate across both political sides. 
So I regard this with foreboding and sadness. At the same time, I also have doubts about the underlying argument and proposition. It seems true to me that the default pronoun being he, or the default last name being the man's last name, are political statements of just the kind that Roberto Unger and Catherine McKinnon suggested. At the same time, in the two areas I know best, law on the one hand and scholarship on the other, my impression is that there is such a thing as neutral excellence. It is not all politics. That is a false appearance that, in fact, there, is, there are principles that are neutral in character, and there is an excellence that is neutral in character. And so I'm left convinced neither of one side or the other. I'm just uncertain what to think. I, I, I find the argument in principle and in many uh, individual instances persuasive. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't think it is a sustainable way to organize social life, and I, it doesn't seem to me to be true of the areas I know best. What is one to think? Perhaps some of you have these same uh, conflicted ideas. We have a wonderful panel to address them. Uh, I'll go in order of speaking. Steve Sachs will speak first from Duke, and then Tara Grove from William and Mary, Christian Brissett from Notre Dame, and Guy Uriel Charles from Duke. Uh, each taking on this topic in a different way. I have no idea what they're going to say. Well, I have just the roughest idea, a glimmer of an idea of what they're going to say. Suffice it to say that there are different opinions on the topic as befits a panel of this nature. Thank you all, and welcome to our panelists. Thank you very much, Josh, and to the panelists and the organizers for having us. I'm going to start with an argument that I'm uh, directly stealing from Oliver Traldi, who is a uh, PhD philosophy student at Notre Dame. Um, this is a potato. Is this potato political? I suggest that the answer is no, and that that's the only non-absurd answer. Therefore, it is not the case that everything is political, QED. <laughs> No, I, I could stop there, but I won't. Um, and so I, I guess the question that this raises, the sort of Morian argument raises, is why would anyone think that everything is political? What would the idea that everything is political be? Because you can imagine the responses. Oh, of course this potato, this one here, is political. Um, you know, just think about the world of farm subsidies or the Irish potato famine or the colonization of America that allowed us to uh, uh, cultivate potatoes worldwide. And and so on. Um, I think what is important and what this example shows us is that we need to separate what is political or what is best understood as political from what can be politically salient. So if the question is, are there questions one could ask that would look through the lens of politics, through the lens of some kind of collective gov self-governance or collective decision-making process that affects a given topic? And the answer is almost always yes. Are those the questions the best way to understand a particular topic? Not always. Um, if you think of an uh, uh, analog, you could ask the question, is everything moral? Well, not everything is necessarily best understood in moral terms. If you're asking, how large is this potato? Where does it grow? What is its uh, you know, manner of development, and so on? Moral answers would tend not to help you very much. But that doesn't mean that there aren't moral questions one could ask about the process of potato cultivation or indeed any other aspect of social life. When we have hobbies, when we have uh, interactions with friends, the language we use, of course all of that could be of moral significance in various ways. In some sense, there is no shelter from the storm there. Um, anything we do can be subject to moral scrutiny. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's the best way to understand every feature of human life. Um, two aspects that flow from that. One is, I think part of the sense that everything is political, if we translate it into is everything moral kind of language, is a question about intensity. Um, is there still a category of imperfect duties, things you, know, you ought to do, um, but that you know, aren't necessarily spelled out? Is there still a category of the supererogatory, things that would be nice, but are not absolutely required? Um, when it comes to politics, often um, the sense that politics is exhausting, that it demands too much, I think comes from a view of the world that denies these kinds of categories of imperfect duties or things that are just supererogatory, um, beneficial but not required. 
those definitely are, are contested in the, in the moral realm, and I think they can be contested in the political realm, too. If you think that you have to be doing at every moment what is the best thing to do morally, likewise, you might think at every moment you have to do what is, ever, what is politically right or politically correct. And I think that that is an exhausting way to live, and that's one of the arguments um, in, the, in the moral discussion um, uh, that, that comes up again in politics. A second way, lesson we can draw from this potato is that a lot of things can attain a secondary political uh, language or sort of secondary political implications even if they're not political in and of themselves. So it could well be that you know, in some future time, having a potato is some sort of protest message. Um, like you know, wearing an orange tie during the Ukrainian Orange Revolution, or eating at Chick-fil-A, which might not have been thought to be a political statement, but now in some ways is. And what counts as a political statement, what our language of politics is, is just going to change. It has nothing to do with the underlying activity, or not always a lot to do with the underlying activity. But what is seen as sending a message depends on what everyone else is doing around that activity. And so there can be things that are not in themselves political, but take on political meaning because of how the rest of us relate to it. So finally, if we're trying to get a sense of do these categories mean that sort of everything has this sort of super added language to it? Should we just sort of accept that and run with it? I think that the answer is no. And I think the answer is that, the, the reason is that if we said everything is political in the sense that it always has additional political meaning, it's always sort of exhaustingly demanding of us, um, we would lose a sense of what politics is for. Uh, when you have a political fight, Part of the point of a political fight is to get to a stage where you can have legal or social changes that are understood apolitically. So I think the best example for us lawyers is enactment of a statute. Um, whether we should have Title VII or not, that was a big political fight. Then they passed it. The fact that it exists is not, in some sense, a political question. That's just an easy, obvious legal question. If you're asking, you know, is there Title VII now, the answer is yes. Um, and that should not be a matter for political dispute. What you want is the kind of durable achievement that will yield non-politically controversial answers about what has been achieved. And that doesn't work if all technical areas of law or of science or of anything else are thought to be politics in disguise. If the question is always open for revision, you know, what does the statute say? What does it mean? What does it provide? If we never get any apolitical answers to that question, then it's not clear what politics has ever brought us. Um, you should be able at some point to say, because of this political fight, we have achieved X, and X can be understood without needing to return to the political fight that gave it birth. Um, I think that if we give in to the temptation to view everything through a political lens, not only will we fail to understand certain features of our friendly potato, but we will also fail to understand what politics is actually for. Thank you. a little bit about polarization. Uh, so Congress is polarized. Um, that seems to be pretty clear. Democrats or Republicans increasingly vote on divided party lines. Is the general public polarized? That is, do people in the general public believe a certain set of predetermined things? That's far less clear. It seems to be more true among elites than the general public, but not clear that the general public seems to be a little bit more divided. The problem with the general public seems to be more what political scientists call effective polarization. That is, people may actually not be as divided as Congress, but people believe that the other side has a certain set of beliefs on abortion or affirmative action or guns, and that the other side is bad, morally problematic. So for example, some political scientists write that Republicans believe that self-identified Democrats must be unpatriotic, ill-informed, and uncharitable, whereas Republicans are patriotic, charitable, and well-informed. And we see this in a large number of aspects of life, including in the personal. Um, so this gets back to something Josh said at the beginning. Are people okay with having their kids marry somebody from the other political party? In 1960, only 
4% of Democrats and 5% of Republicans said they would have a problem with their kids marrying somebody from a different political party. 50 years later, in 2010, 33% of Democrats and 49% of Republicans said they would find it highly problematic if their child married somebody from a different political party. Um, according to a figure in 2016, these numbers may be as high as 60% or up. So it sounds like not as many people are buying how to love the Republican in your life these days. Uh, in fact, only about 9% of married couples as of, as of 2009 were were dual party couples. So what does this mean, this effective polarization? Well, obviously it has some impact on social interaction. Are people willing to talk to folks from the other side if they view people from the other side as inherently untrustworthy and unreliable? It also, it turns out, has an impact on the way people view their members of Congress. So a Republican views a Democratic member of Congress as less trustworthy and more likely to have ulterior motives for what they are doing. And likewise, a Democrat in a district views her Republican member of Congress as less trustworthy. What I would suggest is that these views are increasingly affecting the federal judiciary as well. So, when President Trump talked about Obama judges, that got a lot of attention. After President Trump lost a case and the district court judge happened to be, happened to be appointed by President Obama, President Trump said, oh, well, you know, that was just an Obama judge. As many of you know, Chief Justice Roberts shot back and said, well, no, we don't have Trump judges or Obama judges. We don't have Bush judges or Clinton judges. President Trump replied, quote, sorry, Chief Justice, but you do indeed have Obama judges. It would be great if the Ninth Circuit were indeed an independent judiciary. So President Trump's got, comments got a, lot of, got a lot of attention. But what about what progressives are saying today about the federal judiciary? So Senator Dianne Feinstein recently said the courts are now, quote, packed with young judges whose views are far outside the mainstream. Instead of serving as neutral arbiters, these judges will push a conservative agenda that will have lasting effects for generations. Senator Chuck Schumer said the recent judges are, quote, the most unqualified and radical nominees in my time in this body. Another judge and another commentator said that the Fifth Circuit is descending into lawlessness and that Trump judges are, quote, leading a conservative revolution. Now, lest you think that these are completely new comments, actually, they go back a few decades. Uh, there were far fewer of these comments in the 1980s and 1990s, but in the 1990s, then presidential candidate Bob Dole called out by name several Clinton appointees and talked about what radical liberals they were. And one of my favorite comments from 1984, Senator Ted Kennedy said, then nominee J. Harvey Wilkinson for the, for the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals was, quote, the least qualified nominee ever to be submitted for an appellate court vacancy. Um, but note this trend. It's not that the judiciary is ideological. It's that their side is ideological. My side, my side has independent judges who rule neutrally. The other side has judges that are gonna be biased and ideological. What I wanna to suggest to you is this is a highly problematic thing for the federal judiciary. One thing that political scientists have pointed out, mostly with respect to the Supreme Court, but it applies equally to the lower federal courts, is that the federal judiciary needs sociological legitimacy. That is, it needs external legitimacy in our country. The idea is that people need to perceive the judiciary as independent. And note, I'm not trying to say that judges actually are political in the way that they vote. I'm saying that they are perceived as being biased in the way that they vote against my side if they are from the other side. And this is highly problematic because in order for the federal judiciary to function, people need to view it as legitimate. And not just the people who agree with the federal court decision. It is actually far more important that those who disagree with a federal court decision view the federal judiciary as legitimate so that they will abide by the decision with which they disagree. Political scientists have a refrain that I particularly like. Legitimacy is for losers. We need the losers in cases to believe in the legitimacy of the federal courts. And increasingly, with the rhetoric on both sides, with the increasingly divisive nature of our appointments process, where I submit to you, in the future, if there is a division between the president 
and the Senate, they're controlled by different political parties, we will have few to zero federal judges actually confirmed for the federal judiciary. With this increasingly divided society, this is gonna be highly problematic, not only for the functioning of the federal courts, but also for long-term compliance with federal court decisions. So I'm gonna address two of the sub-questions on the program. Has, is the reach of politics broader now than it once was? And has politics become a substitute for religion? Uh, because implicit in the question of, of is everything political, there's this underlying sense that things have gotten worse. And I don't wanna deny that. I think you know, we can all point to things like Chick-fil-A that were once just a place to eat chicken, and is now there's a reason that Fed Sox student groups always serve it for lunch. Um, there are things that have become political over time, but I wanna also push back against that. Um, uh, and I'd like to suggest that at least in this country, the boundaries of the political have always been unstable. This has always been in flux. And in the interest of time, I'll stick just to the politics of, of consumer goods. Uh, and I'll focus on, on the period of, of, of the nation's founding because uh, you know, this is the, the period in theory that our, our institutions are designed to uh, respond to. So every American school child knows about the Boston Tea Party. Uh, it's another time uh, when Bostonians tried to exclude uh, unwanted consumable goods, just like they've, uh, the mayor of Boston once tried to get kick Chick-fil-A out of his city. Uh, what is less well known, perhaps, is the extent to which Bostonians' rejection of tea reflected a broader tendency in America to politicize consumer goods, to treat consumer goods as a site of political protest. Uh, the historian T.H. Breen has described the consumer boycott as an American invention from this period. All throughout the 1760s and 70s, Americans again and again refused to buy British goods to protest taxes of various kinds. At the same time, previously apolitical goods acquired the sheen of political virtue. Uh, and one of my favorite examples comes from John Adams, who wrote in 1774 uh, to Abigail about a tiring trip to Maine. And he got there and he said, Madam, he asked his temporary landlady, is it lawful for a weary traveler to refresh himself with a dish of tea? Now remember, this is after the tea party. Um, provided the tea has been honestly smuggled uh, <laughs> or paid no duties. And this landlady and you know, this sort of innkeeper uh, in Maine said, no, sir, we have renounced all tea in this place. I can't make tea, but I'll make you coffee. Uh, accordingly, Adam said, I have drank coffee every afternoon since and I've borne it very well. So poor, poor sacrificial John Adams is switching to coffee. Um, tea must be universally renounced. I must be, we I must be weaned, and the sooner, the better. So it seems that, that consumer politics has always been good to the last drop, at least in this country. Um, now, one thing that stands out about this anecdote, though, uh, is, is who the agent of change is, right? The source that, that tells the story, Adams' letter, doesn't even give this woman's first name. She's not a prominent person. But yet, she is pushing Adams, the great patriot leader, into consumer radicalism. She's the one pushing him to get weaned from tea, even honestly smuggled tea. This is like the fair trade of, of, of colonial era, was what was smuggled. Um, and that might be a difference between then and now, is that now, as Tara pointed out, there seems to be a mismatch between the elite sort of the very online who are especially polarized and ordinary people who might be a little bit less so and that, that mismatch might explain what seems new about our current moment. Um, the tea boycott also sheds light on the next question which is the role of religion in politics. Uh, it's striking in reviewing colonial era boycotts the extent to which they talked to, colonists talked about boycotts in religious or quasi-religious terms. Uh, the most extreme example probably comes from the small town of Dartmouth, Massachusetts, uh, whose inhabitants proclaimed, quote, a universal fast from India and English goods. Uh, and this was necessary for their, quote, salvation. And they came to this realization, they said, uh, upon reflecting on the story of Jonah and Nineveh. Uh, but John Adams, too, wrote about the consumption of British goods as a, quote, sin. And now, this is not surprising in a relatively religious society like colonial Massachusetts. Uh, more novel, perhaps, was the emergence of a notion of secular virtue, what Breen and another historian, Edmund Morgan, have described as consumer virtue. Uh, and this existed alongside and to some extent competed with Christian morality. This new consumer virtue allowed ordinary colonists to work out their political salvation merely by exercising appropriate self-restraint in terms of what they bought or what they didn't buy. And perhaps more importantly, they could flaunt the self-restraint in what they wore, for example. So going around in a homespun jacket as opposed to British fine cloth could signal your, your political virtue to your fellow townspeople. So it doesn't seem all that surprising then 
that Americans today continue to project their political impulses onto politics, as their religious impulses onto politics, or that the political morality of everyday consumption competes in some sense with religious morality. Indeed, we're much tamer about it today, right? If you eat Chick-fil-A on the wrong side of town, you're not gonna get your windows broken or hot tar pot poured on you as would have happened if you broke uh, colonial era boycotts. Of course, there are differences. Although Americans have long thought about political commitments in religious or pseudo-religious terms, the tendency was limited by religion itself uh, in several respects. So religion was to some extent an independent competitor with politics as a source of morality and virtue. Uh, religious affiliation competed with partisan affiliation as a source of identity. And communal and institutional religious leadership could serve as a break on polarization. So uh, think, for example, of the uh, good feeling that's supposed to come with every year's Al Smith dinner. Uh, all of that is changing. Uh, institutions are politically weaker. Uh, this is certainly true of my own Roman Catholic Church, uh, at least in the political sphere. And their leaders are, trusted to get, are less trusted to give moral or political guidance. And that, in turn, makes it easier for individuals to form their own consciences based on partisan commitments, uh, to baptize, as it were, their political projects. Uh, and the extreme version of this is partisan sorting by denomination. We increasingly worship with our partisan allies uh, to the extent that we worship with anybody at all. Uh, fewer Americans identify with any faith tradition, and uh, it seems to me likely that they were going to fill that gap with something else, and politics seems like a good candidate for that. Um, but even all of this is not especially new. Americans have always picked or formed churches based on political commitments. Uh, so think, for example, of all of the Protestant churches that split uh, in the run-up to the Civil War over the question of slavery. Um, I'm not sure whether we should find this good or comforting. On one hand, it suggests that this situation that we're in is not totally novel. On the other hand, the examples I'm giving are all from run-ups to divisive and bloody civil wars. So I'm not sure which way this cuts. Um, but this also makes it harder to pin down exactly what is different about today. Uh, again, I do think that there is something different, uh, certainly over the short term, but even over the long term, it's something feels different to me. Um, so my goal in stressing continuity is not to say that nothing has changed, but to help us think more, more carefully about what exactly is the change that we're, we're confronting. Uh, and also, you know, when you think about is everything political, is that a necessary state of our political and institutional life, uh, or is there something that, that has changed and therefore might change again? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, for, this is my first FedSoc event. Uh, and so thanks to my colleague, uh, Steve Sachs, and to those who've organized it. Um, and so I'll make my first political statement. Um, I don't think every, the question, everything is political, uh, emanates from the left. Um, as Tara, I think, has rightly pointed out, this is a question of um, that we as a society are trying to debate from all sides. I think it's an important question. Um, I teach constitutional law, civil procedure, and election law. And I think the commonality among all of those courses is how in a society in which you have variation, differences of opinion, what are the mechanisms that we are using in order to get along together as a polity? And I view that as the central question in an advanced democracy, certainly in our age, and I think there's a lot at stake in how we think through and answer that question. What I want to do is to begin by thinking through what do we mean by political? And I want to um, stress or put some emphasis on four different ways that what we can mean when we say is everything political. Um, the first thing that we can think about is that outcomes are a function of pure political power. So this is where Josh started us off, um, essentially with the McKinnon quote. Um, and yes, there are areas in which that is true, but I think as a, a, ma as a descriptive matter, that is clearly not true of most areas of, of our lives. So for example, um, we don't think getting a job at a law firm is simply a function of one's partisan identity, right? That the outcome is not simply determined by non-merits-based criteria, that is simply a function of who is in power and what it is that they want outside of the external constraints. Um, second, we can mean by political that certain things are contested 
and arenas um, that have become con contested, certain matters, propositions have become contested, and arenas in which they should not have become contested. So this is the interesting example that have been used with respect to Chick-fil-A. It didn't used to be the case that it, it mattered what you ate for lunch when events were being um, sponsored by whatever entity, and now what you eat has become a contested factor in particular domains, and the assumption and the question is that that should not be so, right? So we could mean by political the contestedness of things that should not be contested and domains in which they shouldn't be contested. Third, we could mean by political the political process itself, all right? So that is things that are subject to the political process. And then fourth, we could mean by political partisanship. Right, so that there's a distinction here between everything else and that we have become much more partisan. So just to reiterate, one, way that we could think about what, what it means uh, to be political is that outcomes are simply a function of power and are not a function of other things that we might care about, such as merit um, or rules or norms. It's just a function of who has the power, they dictate the outcome. Second, political could mean contestedness um, and contestedness in domains in which things should not be contested. Um, right, so for example, we might say in our places of worship, certain things have become contested um, and that's the wrong arena. It isn't that they should, that these things ought not be contested. We ought not debate X, Y, or Z, but it's the wrong arena for them to become contested. Um, third, we could simply mean the political process itself or fourth partisanship. Now these are not, this is not exhaustive, but I think it serves to um, frame particularly the, the prior uh, statements, but also also to help us to have a better understanding on answering the question. So if the question is, has everything become political? I think Steve's demonstration of the potato um, is a useful and illustrative one. Well, of course not. Um, and maybe that is at an end. But if the question is, to what extent have certain things that were no, once uncontested have become contested, right? Well, yeah, some things have become political. To what extent have we become more partisan? Um, that certainly is true from the empirical uh, political science literature that Tara has nicely outlined for us. To what extent that um, certain things that were outside of our political process are now placed completely within the political process, that may be true, and to what extent there, that certain categories um, that we've come to rely upon have collapsed, well, that may be true as well, right? So is everything political? No, but are there things to worry about? Yes. So the question next for me is, well, what are the categories that matter? What are the ones that are at stake? And I think this question is particularly relevant for those of us who are lawyers. Um, so for me, I begin with the proposition that there is a difference and there ought to be a difference. So I will make both an is argument as well as an ought argument. Um, there's a difference and ought to be a difference between law and politics. That once everything collapses um, into a either the political arena or everything becomes contested or everything becomes partisan or everything that, um, that is a function of power um, and power simply dictates the outcome, then we're operating in a completely different world. But that is, though there are times in which um, the boundaries, and, that, and that's always been true, and in some respects this is, this is one of the lessons that I take from your um, presentation, Christian, is that there, the boundaries are, are are always being contested. The distinctions between law and politics, the distinction between, I'll come to this in a moment, public and private, right? The various distinctions that we take for granted, the distinction between civil and public, all right? Religion, non-religion, the boundaries are always being contested, but we have not, yet seen a collapse of some of the foundational boundaries that matter, right? And as a lawyer, one of the thing, one of the, one of the categories that matter to me is the distinction between law and politics, however way one wants to describe politics. So it still matters what, whether the defendant committed the crime or not. Right? It's not a function of the defendant's political identity. It's not a function of the, the fact that the defendant has certain powerful friends within the judiciary. Right? And those boundaries are ones that we ought to uphold even where we might contest where the lines are. 
right? So second, facts do matter and facts ought to matter. Right? So it matters whether the defendant was male or female, or it matters whether the plaintiff was in fact discriminated against or was not. Right? It matters whether the plaintiff has a legal right or does not. Um, we'll come to, it comes it's part of a third category. Right? There, these, bound, these categories still matter for us. We have not seen the collapse of those categories. It is not the case that if that we answer the question, was the, defend, was the plaintiff discriminated against? Well, is the plaintiff a Republican or a Democrat? Or is the plaintiff a member of a powerful political group or not? Those are the only things that it's going to matter to us. No, facts still matter and facts ought to matter. And I think at, as lawyers, we ought to insist on the reification of these types of, of those categories. Um, third, the public-private distinction, yes, it is contested, and we mean different things by public, and we may, might mean different things by private, but that distinction is foundational to a free society, right? It still matters that this is my house. Well, this isn't my house. <laughs> And that matters too, uh, right? Um, both as a matter of custom and as a matter of law. So if it is my house and you are trespassing, and we recognize this category of trespassing because we say it is private to me, then I can enlist the help of the state in evicting you or removing you from what is considered to be my premises. Right? Different legal rules apply depending upon the category. So the point that I want to make is while it might be true that there's a lot that is contested, there's there are categories that still matter to us that enables us to easily answer the question, well, of course not everything is political. Nevertheless, um, those categories are under stress. Right? And I think what ought to unite us, no matter who we are, no matter what perspective that we are coming from, is the importance of those categories. Because if we can't agree on the maintenance of those types of categories, if law no longer matters, and if everything is about partisanship or is about contestedness, if facts no longer matter, if the private can no longer be distinguished from the, from, from, from the public, um, if, if the civil can't be distinguished from the criminal, then we no longer have the liberties that we take hold. And all that simply matters is who our allies are. And that is not a world that I don't think any of us want to live in. So this is the reason why I think the question that is being posed is an important one, that we ought to think about the distinctions that we are making, and that we ought to reify as best as we can the important set of categories that are necessary to a free society. Thank you. Well, this was really extraordinary, not only for the uh, quality of those presentations, but also for the admirable brevity of those presentations. It is 643. Uh, I, color me impressed. Um, I thought maybe a nice, a, a, a useful way to proceed would be uh, uh, for me to, to pose questions arising from these presentations, uh, and then to invite uh, uh, talk from the uh, Q&A with the audience. So I noticed certain consistent points in all four presentations. One was the idea that, I'll put it this way, Walt Whitman, uh, in his musings, his essayistic musings on democracy, talked about a quality of fe fellow feeling he called adhesiveness. He said, democracies need a measure of adhesiveness. I think that is well taken. The things that sustain democracies are not just constitutionally recognized electoral processes, uh, or e even a, a, a constitution regarded as legitimate, but uh, certain kinds of fellow feeling that are fundamentally emotional and that are uh, and, and, that, and that we cannot sustain democratic community without. I don't know if we can sustain any political community without them. And another consistent element of your presentations was, was this feeling that we need these sort of spheres set aside from the political struggle so that we can love each other a little bit and have some adhesiveness with each other regardless of our political disagreements. Also consistent in the presentations was the recognition that those are uh, artificial and changeable. Uh, so a potato. 
can become political. An orange tie can become political. Eating Chick-fil-A can be become political. Um, it might have once been that we could set aside our political differences to watch a game of basketball together, but that could change. Uh, it could change if, well, it changed with American football quite recently with, uh, with the protest movement uh, that uh, took over football. And perhaps some of what this uh, partisan era has, has shown us and, and what alarms us so much is the sense that the areas of life that are subject to political dispute and in which our fellow feeling may be frayed have expanded. It, church might have once been a place where we could come together across party lines. Or literally love, romantic love, might have once been such a place. Uh, uh, or what we eat, or how we dress, but now all of it is subject to the same political storm, which has the same fundamental ill effect, which is fraying our bonds of fellow feeling and community with each other. All right. So if both of these things are true, if it is, if it is the case that, uh, uh, that we need a measure of adhesiveness, and that, there, that the, the areas that have sustained that adhesiveness are fraying, <coughs> Um, what, I guess what areas should we set aside now? Is it statutes? That seems unrealistic to me, that, that statutes would be a sort of stable political settlement set aside from the political storm. Actually, when Trump and, and um, uh, Chief Justice Roberts dispute whether there are Obama judges and uh, Bush judges or Trump judges, uh, in the interpretation of the Constitution and statutes, Trump is right. Chief Justice Roberts is proffering a sort of noble lie to inspire the legitimacy of the courts, but there's no question that Trump is right. What about what Guy brought up, the, um, the idea that it still matters whether the plaintiff did it or whether the de criminal defendant did it, right? Not just is he a Republican or a Democrat. Boy, when you, I, I work, I've been working recently in the clinic uh, of Northwestern Law School uh, defending uh, children accused of homicide, and they do not care if he did it. It is part of the political struggle. Even, is this my home? I could see that taking on a political cast. It, so I guess I'd like to press on what might be a sustainable set aside where we could actually uh, cultivate adhesiveness uh, even in the present political climate. There it is. Well, let me take a stab at it. So I think it, one of the things that we can do is, as I mentioned toward the end of my remarks, is to the extent that we believe in certain types of categories, um, we ought to try to sustain them, particularly and especially when they don't benefit us and our sides, um, all right? So um, we can't give in to the, a criminal justice process that does not care about whether the defendant committed the crime or not. Um, if we've given that up, then there's nothing left to the game. Um, we can't give in to the enforcement of norms um, simply because those, we now have the power and the, enforcing those norms um, is no longer politically advantageous. Right? So I think it matters, particularly where we have power, um, to reinforce categories, to reinforce norms, to reinforce distinctions, um, where doing so, at least in the short term, won't benefit the side that is in power. And that, I, it seems to me, is one of the ways, and perhaps the necessary way, of pushing back um, against what I would hope to be um, a tide that we can all agree on is not just a dangerous tide, but is a precursor to an overwhelming tsunami. 
So I, I have a, a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I want to push against the idea that Trump is right and Chief Justice Roberts was wrong. Uh, there is a subset of cases that the federal judiciary deals with where you can see some ideological leanings affect the ju judicial decisions. There's no question. Those tend to be cases where the doctrine is pretty vague or, or the constitutional text has never been elucidated by doctrine. Um, and we do see that at the Supreme Court and to a lesser extent at the lower federal courts. We also see a tremendous amount of agreement um, in cases where there's agreement on interpretive method or just in cases that are not politically salient. Now, these are not the cases that senators and presidents and interest groups tend to care about in the appointments process, but the vast majority of courts of appeals decisions are still unanimous. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. And so I, 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 I think that there is a subset of cases where there's some truth to Trump's statement, but there are a lot of cases where there's a tremendous amount of truth to, to what Chief Justice Roberts said, and I hope that that continues to be the case. The second thing I want to say picks up on um, some of Christian's remarks, um, as, as well as, as Guillaume's remarks, um, and, and, and your question about how none of this is fixed. I think we should take some hope and inspiration from that fact. Um, so many of my remarks were somewhat, uh, somewhat concerned, concerned about the judiciary in our current polarized society, but I don't assume that our polarized society is going to continue to be polarized in the same way. Um, one of my colleagues likes to point out to me, well, we're the most polarized we've ever been since the mid-20th century. Now, why do we focus on the mid-20th century? Well, that's when political start scientists started to measure polarization. We have no measurements <laughs> prior to that time. Um, and anyone who has read about the late 19th century, and I'm talking about the post-Civil War late 19th century, that is the people who didn't enter another fight, the Democrats and Republicans hated each other. I mean, with bitterness that is just unbelievable today. Um, they got into fights sometimes. And when, when I look back at that period and what happened? Well, in the early 20th century, the Republican Party started a split between economic conservatives and progressives, and then there were splits over time within the Democratic Party as well. The reason there was less polarization in the mid 20th century is that there had been these splits within the parties over the course of time. I do not assume that the current level of polarization will remain the same. I don't assume that the parties are gonna remain the same. I think there, one can already see within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party a lot of internal divides that do not fit together particularly nicely. Um, and to me, that, that actually gives me a great deal of hope for the future that the current divides may change over time and that may cause some of what we ca currently call political divides to be, we're gonna have factions, as Madison told us, in some way, shape, or form, but I think those factions will look different as time goes by, or at least I hope so. so um, I think I'd pick up on, a, on an aside that you made, sort of many, maybe any political community um, needs adhesiveness need set aside? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I think um, a good example of that, um, uh, I was uh, studying abroad and taking economics, and an example of a public good that was offered was the queen. Um, you know, the, the queen is non-rival and non-excludable. Everyone can have the queen, and you know, you can't prevent anyone from, from enjoying the benefits of, of her existence. Um, and if you think about the, uh, the the you know events around uh, you know Will and Kate's wedding, and they had block parties all over England. You know, it doesn't have to be a democratic phenomenon per se, but any sort of community is going to have forms of adhesiveness that are very political. I mean, you had you know British flags all over the place, um, but at the same time, were not experienced as such. Um, they were you know opportunities for group bonding over whatever it was, and I think any kind of community that's going to be called to make sacrifices for the good of the whole needs some degree of fellow feeling where people um, have a sense that they're, that they're in it together. And I think that one way in which lots of things seem political is the way that, you know, it's, it's that sort of fellow feeling that is afraid that people see divisions being deeper and uh, present in more arenas um, than they had thought previously. So if the question then is, what do we set aside now? Well, I think there, there are two uh, ways to look at that. And again, not an exclusive list. Um, one uh, point that I think he drew out that's very important is, is arenas of intellectual honesty. I mean, we're all here as academics. Um, there, are, there are academic norms that are, you know, 
again, have all sorts of political salience, but are best understood through other kinds of lenses that are something over and above um, political power in academic institutions. And I think the Trump-Obama judges uh, case is a good example of that. Like, surely it's different. I mean, if one hears that you've got a panel of three Trump appointees versus a panel of three Obama appointees, even on a wide range of things, even on things where the doctrine is not so contested, you might expect different answers from the panel. But that's different from a world in which the reason you would expect different answers are questions of partisan loyalty. Um, is it just that the, uh, the different presidents pick people who favor different modes of interpretation or different intellectual approaches to the law and are doing so honestly, sort of within their own field, or are they really sort of on a team and are they team players? I think those are very different worlds, worlds in which uh, partisan identification has a very different valence. And it's in, in a world where, you know, Everyone is pursuing by their own lights the correct answers on the law, and politicians and you know presidents and senators reliably pick different people to fill those offices given their different approaches. Is a world where it's much easier to imagine discussion across party lines than one in which people really see themselves as a team and as advancing team goals. Um, I think a second area that we should think about in terms of the, what are these set asides beyond just questions of um, intellectual honesty versus team playing is what are the incentives for polarization? You know, why, why would someone seek to polarize um, or seek to take an area that is a set aside and make it not so? And sometimes you do that for very good reasons. Hey, this area that's set aside, in fact, is covering up a large amount of disagreement that we might really not want. You know, maybe we, uh, you know, the 4th of July parade in some sense is the, you know, uber political activity and in other ways it is, you know, the thing that the community gets together to do to really enjoy um, being out there together and to have fellow feeling and is the perfect set aside. And so if we can ask questions, you know, why, is, why now is there something to be gained by polarization? The answer could be, you know, for very good reasons to achieve better results on the ground or for bad reasons that, that you, you can sort of make a, a cheap uh, mark and sort of name for yourself uh, by, by uh, uh, breaking down set-asides more so than by building them. Um, I don't know what the answers are in, in particular areas, but I think those are the questions we'd have to be asking. Oh, so your, your queen example reinforces Tyra's point that things can don't always get worse, right? So right. there were times when the monarchy was, was the most divisive <laughs> issue, right, yes. in, in, in British politics. That is no longer the case. So there, there is sort of a long-term things might change for the better. All right. Well, let's open it up to questions from the floor. Do we have a mic out there? We do. Okay. So uh, raise your hand. The mic will find you. And, uh, and, and um, um, Jean, is that a hand? Uh, no, go, go ahead. I was uh, fascinated by um, a comment that Professor Charles made. Um, I've been doing a lot of research in the rule of law. And um, Professor Kleinfeld started by citing Unger, as opposed to someone like uh, Michael Oakeshott, Friedrich Hayek, or Lon Fuller, who try to come up with approaches that are uh, more neutral to law, uh, law in a pluralistic society. How do we approach that? Are you familiar with that work, and, and does that feed into your comments? Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm familiar with, with some of it. Uh, when you ask, does it feed into my comments? Um, not, I would say, not intentionally, but um, but <laughs> um, because as, I, as I've been thinking about these comments, I've also been reflecting on some of these similar questions, but I would say unintentionally so. I'm looking for hands. It's a little hard to see. Uh, David's got one up over here. Yeah, so I was thinking that a lot of the divisiveness is uh, is tied to a sense of victimhood and just to be completely nonpartisan and non-ideological about it, it extends across uh, various, you know, all different groups. So, you know, just to take a counter example for the, from the federal side kind of side, uh, conservative Christians now feel offended if you say happy holidays to be more sensitive and inclusive. Oh, you're engaging in a war on Christmas, which is a war on Christians, and so forth. But the interesting sociological aspect of this to me, and I guess maybe law professors aren't, a, aren't the best equipped to discuss this, is it seems to me from an objective perspective, in almost any group that you could think of, except maybe people residing in the United States illegally, uh, you are 
freer, more prosperous, and so forth now. We, are, we live in a freer, more prosperous, more tolerant society by every objective measure than, than ever before in American history. And yet people feel themselves on all sides of the political spectrum to be more victimized and to be the subjects of attacks by others than ever before. And I don't understand, you know, I, I struggle to understand uh, how those two things could both be true, how we could, be freer and more prosperous and more tolerant by objective measures and yet all feel more under attack and under threat than ever before at the same time. So um, this, this is by no means my wheelhouse, so I'd welcome correction on any of this. Um, I, I think there are um, two possible explanations. Um, one is that um, you know, technological changes and changes in media cause us to be aware of a lot of terrible arguments that we disagree with, and so therefore, uh, in ways that we could we could uh, uh, very well avoid beforehand. Um, so it may be that that we we feel attacked because we see attacks, and other we are brought into contact with others who disagree violently with us and are not very good at arguing necessarily um, on both sides of the issue. Um, a, a second thing is um, Jonathan Haidt, I believe, has, has written about shifts from cultures of honor, cultures of dignity, and cultures of victimhood. So, um, you know, there were periods where, you know, if you were slighted, the expectation was like, oh, well, you're going to challenge them to a duel, of course. You know, or alternatively, um, you would say, like, well, if you're slighted, you're just going to have, you know, a dignified silence and not let it bother you. Um, or if you're slighted, then the correct answer is to seek uh, some sort of authoritative uh, recognition of your of your uh, grievance and sort of public res official resolution, um, and arguing that that we have moved to a, a, a more cultural victimhood style of society. I don't know if that is true, um, and uh, you know I, I'm not even sure that that is uh, uh, the best way to represent Height's argument. But I think if that were true, it might explain why people feel. Uh, more endangered in various ways than would necessarily have been the case. We'd also add, which we haven't really talked about, the fact that the 20, 21st century America, particularly 21st century America, is obviously a very different demographically um, um, set of uh, groups and categories than in any other time all right, and in American history, with different groups vying for political power, um, with um, contestedness with respect to the amount of power that 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 people have, um, and a sense of group fluidity. Uh, so, in some respects, it's not surprising um, that various groups are feeling that their particular, either, either they're losing or they're not gaining enough comparatively to, right? So, um, so w it's one of the things that, that we haven't talked about, which I think actually think makes this question even more important, given the greater demographic, um, geograph, uh, um, racial, ethnic, di religious diversity of 21st century America, um, how really then do we think about the role of various groups as they try to attain and maintain um, political power. So it's, it's not surprising to me that, um, that people feel a sense of loss uh, given um, the, the contestedness of political power and social power in, in, in this domain. Other answers to David's question? I just wanted to pick up on, on Guy's comment just now. One of the interesting things about our current political moment is it's not clear which party is going to hold power at any given moment. It's switching constantly. And that's highly different from other periods of our history. Uh, one of the reasons there was less political conflict in the, in the early 19th century compared to today is that the Jeffersonians won. And the Federalists were pretty much obliterated as a party soon after the War of 1812. Um, and right now, there not only is not, neither party winning, um, it's hard to see any party winning anytime soon because there, there are substantial numbers on, on both sides. And I think that increases the stakes for each election. Yeah, I think it's also true that, that most Americans tend to exist in several spheres at once. And so it's very hard not only for one party to win definitively, but for any political group to win definitively in every sphere. So even Republicans now, uh, they might feel, well, we have the presidency, but of course Hollywood's attacking us, whatever it is, or vice versa. 
and that also leads, you know, so even when one is winning, winning politically, one can always point to some area in which one is losing, and that can also, I think, feed the sense of grievance. Kevin? Um, I have a recommendation and then a question. Um, the recommendation in terms of uh, this thing that might be this unifying thing that creates fellow feeling for us might be a commitment to civil discourse. And I mean like actual civilized and enjoyable discourse in a way that we enjoy boxing matches, um, but in a way that would take sustained effort over time. Um, people say freedom isn't free and usually think about having to fight wars and die and bleed. Um, but I think also if you want people to really enjoy civil discourse more, you have to spend time and energy and money um, and you know, fostering uh, an engagement and then actually marketing it to large numbers of people so that they turn out for the engagement and participate and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's the recommendation. The question for those who are interested in fellow feeling as this solution, or at least this important component that has to exist even as we have all these conflicts, um, to what degree do you need the fellow feeling to be genuine? Um, and I ask because I am worried about fellow feeling that is either A, based on a lie, or B, coerced through laws and violence. And I think um, some people are okay with that if they think the um, benefits outweigh the costs, and I'm just curious across the panel where you guys land on that one. Uh, I don't think it has to be genuine. There's a, there's a wonderful book by uh, mm -hmm. Teresa Bajan called Mere Toleration, and the premise is that toleration can work very well uh, if different groups approach each other with, with sort of a charitable hatred uh, on the model of, say, Roger Williams, the, the Rhode Island uh, sort of religious radical. So he would tolerate, he's very famous for, for creating this tolerate, this a tolerant experiment in Rhode Island, uh, but it wasn't toleration based on everyone's fine, I'm good, you're good. It was toleration based on uh, I have the truth and I'm gonna try to convince you of this, but there's sort of mutual, there is mutual respect in a sense, but it's not based on, on, on a sort of a, a deep, and maybe there is a deep love in a Christian sense, but not a, a sort of a deep warm and fuzziness to it. So I, I think that that sort of maybe uh, reducing our expectations for, for, for civility might be a, a way to go. Mm -hmm. The I, I, book on tolerance. As well, yeah, yeah. I, I was just, uh, I, I uh, despair of uh, civil discourse as a solution uh, because civil discourse is one of the uh, balls we're kicking down the field right now. Uh, right now, um, uh, a, a, an institution like the Federalist Society sa champions the idea of civil discourse, and on the other side, we see uh, norms of discourse where certain views are condemned and, and, and uh, that is, I'm trying to put this in neutral terms and it's hard, it's like my tongue wraps around itself trying to put this neutrally. Um, uh, right now, I, I think, I, I'll put it this way, uh, my brother who is a, a Marxist progressive uh, would say that civil discourse is the rhetoric of the right which it uses to protect itself from the condemnation it so richly deserves. That's, that was, that's what my brother would say. Um, and that just shows how the very idea of sort of exchange of free ideas be, in a reasoned way without condemnation of one another becomes itself part of the political dispute. And so It's interesting because people on the other side would say the very same thing, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 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 no, I, I was, was going to say, I, I think that is, oh, I'm sorry, for you. No, it was done. I would hope you could clarify what, what was the, the people on your side? Uh, well, meaning that some would say, look, um, it's the right that is uninterested in civil discourse. The right would say it's the left that's uninterested in civil discourse. But, you know, sort of, again, I objected the way that we framed the question from a right or left perspective. Um, so, and then the issue is sort of how, do, how does one get out of that cycle. No, I, I was just going to say that I found you know 2016 being very interesting in that respect because there was a huge um, uh, emphasis on the message on the right side. Um, you know, now is the time to take the gloves off. The other side, you know, we always play nice. We're the Washington generals. Um, you know, we, we're just there to, to go down to defeat. And what we need is finally people who will stand up and fight. And what's interesting is to see exactly the same thing being said on the other side. That, you know, the problem that we have with the Democratic Party is that, you know, we're always too nice. And it's the Republicans who are super organized, and the Republicans. And I think that that is just a, a, a general fact about, you know, it's exactly what you said about how, you know, my side is neutral and the other side 
side is ideological. Everyone always sees the other side as, as more Machiavellian and better, better uh, planned than it is. Um, but I think on the question of whether the fellow feeling has to be genuine, I would say absolutely not. And I think the best example for this is, you know, and comes up in these contexts all the time, is Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and you do not have to like, you know, your crazy cousin. Um, but, you know, you, you smile and, you know, shake hands and all sit down to Thanksgiving dinner together and pretend to like them for a few hours um, every November. And I think that that goes a long way. Could I say two things about this? One is, um, uh, the, the one problem with looking at civil discourse as a norm that can sustain us, regardless of the fact, or in addition to the fact that it is itself disputed and both sides claim the other lacks it, is there is no incentive to adhere to civil discourse when you have numbers. Right? Civil discourse is for people who lack numbers. If you have numbers, you really don't need it. You can engage in a condemnatory discourse and just trust your majorities. I just think strategically, um, in fact, you shouldn't have, strategically, there's no interest, I should say, in having a reasoned discourse or exchange at all to the extent you have the votes you need. Right. That's a very and cynical it, view. No, but that's I, true. Yeah. Right. But I think that's what makes it, I, I don't screw that, but that's what makes it, when one has the power, restraint, I think, is the best way of enforcing norms. Right. I mean, and we recognize that in a lot of the areas that, that we do. You know, many of us are either in faculty hiring or do we don't simply say, right, the, or the best functioning law faculties don't say we have the votes. We're going to ram it through. Right. We people recognize that no, we may have the votes, but that, that but really, if you want to sustain a um, a uh, an institution in which people respect each other. Um, and they want to get along, then in part precisely because you have the votes, you work really hard to, um, to provide at least process, um, if not a certain amount of substantive voice, right? So I, I agree with you that, um, that civility is often uh, unnecessary, but, it, but it's precisely because it is unnecessary that it's exercise when one has power is meaningful and norm reinforcing and doesn't simply say, we have the political power, therefore. Randy? Earlier today, I, this morning, I attended a panel discussion on the Second Amendment um, that was one of the hot takes panels that had to get a hot take panel here, you have to, at the ALS, you have to submit a proposal with your list of participants. It's got to be passed upon by a committee. Part of the criteria for passing upon these hot takes is that there be intellectual diversity, or there be diversity, so let's put it that way, uh, which is part, and intellectual diversity is part of the bylaws of the ALS, a requirement of intellectual diversity, which was, was touted to us by the welcoming talk of the incoming ALS president at the beginning of this, of this conference. Um, this panel was a panel of eight people and two moderator commentators. One of the eight people uh, didn't show for personal reasons. Um, uh, of the seven people who were there, all seven were on the same side of the Second Amendment issues. Uh, there was no disagreement. There was, they were in 100% lockstep uniform agreement with each other throughout the entire hour and a half program. Uh, the, the, the eighth person who wasn't there would also have been in disagreement with that. And she would have just been an expert uh, 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 on the stuff that they were already agreeing about. Um, I was told privately that there was a ninth person invited who would have provided uh, disagreement, but who dropped out of the program at some stage in the development. So uh, they couldn't be accused of maybe never having anyone on the program. Um, but, the, but I can tell you there was no discourse. There was no civil, I mean, they were civil to each other, uh, but there was no intellectual interaction with anyone who didn't share their views um, at this conference earlier today. Um, I could see this coming. I saw the program. I saw who was on it. I knew I didn't recognize anyone's name as someone who uh, would be on the other side of the Second Amendment issue. Um, so I went because I didn't want to complain about something until I saw it for myself. And I had to sit, and so, I, so I had to sit through this whole thing. Um, uh, I should just tell you as a matter of substance, uh, seven, uh, six of the seven people spent their entire time talking about labeling and marketing and rhetoric. Uh, one person had a substantive discussion on 
levels of scrutiny and types of scrutiny associated with gun rights cases, which was actually quite informative and informed by someone who knows what he's talking about. Um, on the other side, but still, it was, I learned, you know, it was good. Uh, that was the program. That's what we, and I can just tell you that after years of meeting with, in a collective way, the leadership of the AALS to try to achieve intellectual diversity um, for year, over a course of years, uh, formally at the highest levels, uh, repeatedly, uh, this is the result. So this goes to the point where if you have the power and someone else has the power here at AALS, the best, that they, the best you can hope for is that they'll politely listen to you as you complain about your exclusion. But other than that, short of a lawsuit, which is not there, I don't know that there's a legal basis for a lawsuit, but short of something like that, there's nothing that can be done. You can respectfully ask for inclusion all you like, and they will just look at you and say, we are committed to intellectual diversity, and that's it. That's all you'll get from them. Now, the alternative, of course, is incivility on the part of the people who are being excluded. Obviously, most social movements, most oppressed social movements in this country have had to resort to that uh, effectively, um, usually. Um, but that is the result. And I do think the people who happen to be in power, and I, in power in this organization and in the law schools that most of us teach at, um, they count on the fact that the people that are being excluded will not resort to that. They rely on that. They, they don't even think about it because it's just so beyond the pale to think. Uh, we had a speaker at Georgetown deplatformed. The first time we've had a speaker deplatformed, forced off the stage um, by both insiders and outsiders, um, a member of the Trump administration. It hasn't happened in American law school as far as, I'm con as far as I know until Georgetown, it happened at Georgetown. Uh, the people who did that and the, my faculty colleagues who were commenting on this on the, on the listserv before and after the event, uh, certainly assumed that nothing like this could ever happen to them. No one is going to march into their classroom and deplatform them. Uh, all the same arguments could be made in justification for deplatforming them, but they know as well as I know, I'm not going to do it. My Federal Society students are not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Why? Because we're civil and we won't do it. Um, maybe we should do it. Maybe that's the answer. I'm not advocating it, but I'm really not sure I see uh, exactly what the alternative is when one group, when it's numbers, as Josh says, when, when you, have the set, you have the safety of your numbers um, and you can just do what you want and you just don't have to care. You just don't have to care uh, about what you're doing because nobody makes you care. It would have been interesting to hear you at the civil rights, at the height of the civil rights <clears throat> movement. Um, this is one of the things I studies um, the history of race and law. And part of what's so fascinating about being a minority in, a, in the history of this country without political power is the extent to which the debates over um, how do you counter power when you don't have it, mm -hmm. right? And the core norms of precisely civility, um, right? It's, it's the, most, the, the, the most fascinating thing in the history of countering power and the role that civility plays um, and its aspect. In fact, within the civil rights framework, the politics of respectability and the debates over politics of respectability as a way of countering the use of not just political power, but physical power, right? I, I, I lived through, right, live through the civil rights era. That's deeply fascinating. So, um, right, so maybe you're right that the right answer to, to that should have always been the exercise of not just a lack of civility, that was a debate as, uh, as you know, um, not just the absence of civility, but also the things that come with it, um, right? Um, and yet, interestingly, the choice fundamentally uh, was to disagree, uh, but interestingly to disagree, right, the concept of civil disobedience. Um, you know, I, so I think you bring up a really interesting point, and it's, it's worth thinking through what the historical examples teach us. So as you talk about that, that's, that's where my mind goes. I, well, I lived through that era, and I saw the tactics that were used, and it wasn't just one tactic that was used. There were multiple tactics that were used, up to and including armed resistance, also used at the same time, simultaneously. So different people advocated different tactics at the time. Um, uh, so, but 
we don't see, we, I think the people who are now in power in these institutions, they're not in power in every institution, but they're now in power in these institutions, um, I think they are very, very uh, um, uh, ass well assured that nothing like that is going to be aimed in their direction, that they're only going to be met with civil pleas uh, for, uh, uh, for civil discourse in return. And you know, some of them, out of noblesse oblige, will give it to you. Um, uh, I'm pretty well treated at Georgetown in this respect. I'm not disrespected. Um, so it's not like I have a hard life. But um, my students, not quite so much by, her, their, by their peers, let's say. Anyway, it's a long topic. I'm just saying that uh, I just want to sort of underscore what Josh said about the power of, of, the, of, of having the numbers, which was reflected in the panel this morning. Not only did ALS have the numbers, so they didn't have to worry about a program, but this particular program had the numbers, and it was 100% on a topic that was very, very easy to identify people who would have taken a different view. It's, it, this is a... a, a a hard topic uh, to end on, uh, a hard subject to end on, but it, 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 our program is out of time. And I think it's an illuminating uh, place to end on because it underscores the difficulty of the dilemma uh, facing, um, facing the country and facing us, which is that the uh, impulse to, um, uh, to, to find places that are set aside from political dispute where we can uh, engage with each other civilly and peacefully and with a measure of fellow feeling are urgently needed but all too difficult to find. And so why don't we end with the, with the problem. And thank, thank you and thanks to our panelists. Mm -hmm.